So the first thing that I'm going to talk about, I don't really want you guys to write it down because it's going to be a lot of calculus stuff and you're not going to know what a lot of the symbols mean and that's fine. Uh, I just want to write them down because it will help me uh, talk about some conceptual things. So this first part is just conceptual. So I just want you to listen and try to understand what I'm talking about. And then I'll tell you when you can start writing down equations. So you don't need to write these down. So Maxwell's equations are what governs all of electricity and magnetism. So there's four of them and they look like this. I mean, there's different ways that you can write them, but they all have pretty similar structure. So like this upside, so this is like doing calculus in three dimensions. And so of course you guys don't need to know that these triangles that are dot product with vectors are called divergences. And then the triangle with a cross product are called curls. And in words, what these equations are telling you is that I can get an electric field by having some kind of charge density. I, there's no way to get a magnetic field from a point source. So this is basically telling you that there are no magnetic monopoles, which is something I talked about earlier. If you find a magnetic monopole, you win a Nobel Prize. And then these two equations are telling you that, well, I guess I'll talk about that. So like I said, this is calculus and in three dimensions. So this is like, high like calc three stuff. So you guys don't need to know that, but we have seen these equations just written a different way. So this is called Gauss's law. And one, if you do Gauss's law on a point source, then you will get this equation for the electric field for a point source. So you guys have seen this equation on the right before. The equation on the left is just a more general and calculus-based version of the thing on the right. Then the third equation we've seen, this is Faraday's law. Which we saw was written as this change in flux over change in time. And then this last equation, uh, so the first part of it is Ampere's law, which I didn't talk about in name, uh, but this is the thing that governs like the magnetic field for a straight wire. which we've seen is written like this. And so you, we have been kind of dealing with these equations, but just in very specific instances, like for the electric field for a point charge, 
or the magnetic field for a straight wire or the voltage that you get from a changing magnetic flux. Okay. So that's, so Maxwell's equations are governing all of the electricity and magnetism stuff that we've done so far. And if we look now at Faraday's law and Ampere's law, So those were the last two equations that looked like this. Uh, so the These two things are derivatives. So this just means change in magnetic field over time. So the way that we've written that in class is just this. And then this is change in electric field over time, which in class we've just written like this. So what the what these equations are saying, so what the first one is saying is that we can generate electric fields through a changing magnetic field. And then what the second equation is saying is we can generate magnetic fields by changing electric fields. And so we've kind of already seen that, right? So if we change, if we had a magnetic flux, we could get a voltage and a voltage is the same thing as a, uh, or a change in voltage over change in position is the same thing as an electric field. So what we haven't seen yet is that we can get a magnetic field by changing our electric field. And so this So this first part is really Ampere's equation or Ampere's law. And then the second part is Maxwell's correction. to Ampere's law. So I'm gonna rewrite those equations again. Uh, but now I'm going to get rid of the first part 
of the Ampere's law and just include Maxwell's correction. Okay. So again, this is maybe not something that you guys would be expected to recognize, but these two sets of equations uh, describe wave-like behavior. And the propagation speed of this wave is this. So this is where you guys should start taking your notes. So a changing magnetic field gives you an electric field and a changing electric field gives you a magnetic field that describes something that behaves like a wave. And the propagation speed of that wave is this. And like, if you're doing higher level math, you can, you'll, you would be able to see that you take these constants that are in your wave equation, and this would be the propagation speed of that wave. So, I'll have you guys calculate what this propagation speed is. And just trust that whatever these units are in, well, they all play nicely together. So I'll have you guys plug that into your calculator and tell me what you get. Right, so about three times 10 to the eight, right? And the units on that are gonna be meters per second. So do you guys know what has that speed? Or what that's the speed of? It's a very famous speed. Yeah, it's light. So this is the this is the speed of light, which we write as the variable lowercase c. So this stuff that we've been learning about electricity and magnetism. It all comes together because changing magnetic fields create electric fields and changing electric fields create magnetic fields. And that behavior is a wave and that wave propagates at the speed. And so this changing magnetic field into electric field and changing electric field into magnetic field is light. So, Maxwell's equations, while they all apply to like the stuff we've done so far with point charges and stuff and circuits and stuff, the like end goal of all of this is that this describes light. And of course, light is very important to everything in the universe, life, stars, everything. So another thing to notice with this equation are these uh, mu naught and epsilon naught. So the, the zero denotes that it's a, in vacuum. So this three times 10 to the eight is the speed of light in vacuum or like outer space basically. And so if you are in a different medium, like the air or in water, then the speed of light is different. And we'll see the implications of that in a little bit, uh, like later in the semester. So, okay. 
So this is the representation of that electromagnetic wave that we were just talking about. So if you want to imagine the, the electric field in yellow, so the electric field is just propagating up and down like this. And then the magnetic wave is coming out of the board and then going back into the board. So I can't really draw in three dimensions. So that's why it's easier to just show a picture like this. And so uh, one of the concepts to take away from this is that if the magnetic field or the electric field is oscillating in the y direction and the magnetic field is oscillating in the z direction, then the direction that the wave is traveling has to be perpendicular to both of those. And so the wave is traveling in the x direction. So electric field oscillating in Y, magnetic field oscillating in Z would give you a wave propagating in the X direction. So whatever two directions the fields are, are oscillating in, the direction of travel will be perpendicular to those uh, directions of oscillation. Uh, so we saw that the direction of the propagation of the electromagnetic wave is perpendicular to the direction in which the electric and magnetic fields are oscillating. So in the example we saw, the electric field was oscillating in the y direction. The magnetic field was oscillating in the z direction. And so the velocity or the direction of propagation was in the x direction. So I guess we can do another example. So what if I tell you that the electric field is in the X, the magnetic field is in the Y, then what would be the direction of propagation for the velocity? Yeah. Okay. So we'll maybe do one more. What if I tell you the velocity is in the Y, the magnetic field is in the X, then what would be the direction of oscillation of the Y? Right. Okay. So just pick the one that isn't shown yet. Okay, so now, um, there are other characteristics of a wave, right? So I'll just draw a simple wave in two dimensions. So kind of what we've talked about so far is just this propagation speed. Uh, but what are some other properties of waves, and you can 
you should be able to tell just by looking at this drawing, what are some things that we haven't talked about yet? So let's say this was a time on the x-axis. If I tell you what's on the y-axis, then that'll answer my question. Yeah, sure. So that's one thing. So the period is the time to go from peak to peak. And instead of talking about period, what we'll talk about is the frequency, which is just one over the period. So this is frequency, and this is period. And then what other thing can we measure from this graph? So you measured something in the x-axis direction, which is time in this case, but what about on the y-axis? What can we measure there? Right. So the amplitude, I guess, depending on how you measure it, it could just be from the, the peak to the middle, or you can do peak to trough and then divide by two. So the amplitude of light, we're going to call the intensity. And I'll talk about that equation in a moment. So the So we talked about the frequency and we said that that was one over the period. And another thing that we can measure is called the wavelength. And that's kind of, just what it says. So if you want, if you were to, so the, the graph that I showed you back here had time on the x-axis, but you could also make a graph of like position on the x-axis. And then when you measure from peak to peak here, this is the wavelength. So it's like literally what the name describes. It's just the length of the wave in physical space, whereas the period of the wave is the length of the wave in time. And so wavelength, or I guess, so frequency is the lowercase f, wavelength is lambda, which is a Greek letter, lambda. And there's a relationship between frequency and wavelength that uses the speed of light c. So if you take your frequency, and you multiply it by your wavelength, then you get the speed of light. Or since you know the speed of light is constant, if you have frequency, then you can calculate wavelength, or if you have wavelength, you can calculate frequency. And so also people will maybe use frequency and wavelength, not interchangeably, but like, you can describe different types of light either using wavelength or frequency, and it means kind of the same thing. 
Uh, so I'll talk about that briefly. So there's obviously light that we can see and that we call that visible light. Do you guys know of any other kinds of light that exists? Yeah, so there's, so I guess I'll start in the middle. So this is visible, then ultraviolet. I guess I'll go this way. Any other kinds of light? Yeah, so infrared is longer wavelength. So this is, so as I go this way, I am doing shorter wavelengths or higher frequency. And then as I go down this way, I'm doing longer wavelength and shorter frequency. And so it, it makes sense that you guys would know these two because they are, they're named after things that we can see. So in the visible light spectrum, we have the, the Roy G. Biv. So we have red, orange, yellow. Oh, I don't have enough room to write all that. Red, yellow, orange. green, blue, and violet. So if you take something that's a little bit shorter wavelength than violet, then we can't see it anymore. And we call that ultraviolet light. And then same thing with red. If we take something that's a little bit longer wavelength than red, and we can't see it, then we call it infrared. So there are both longer and shorter wavelengths of light than that. So on the longer side, we have microwaves and radio waves. And then on the shorter side, we have X-rays and gamma rays. And so these are like, they're all light. So they all obey the same physical laws, but they all have different energies. And so the, uh, that might be something that we talk about a little bit later, but the shorter your wavelength or the higher your frequency, the more energy the light has. So the gamma rays are very high energy and the radio waves are very low energy. Uh, but these all have different applications. So radio waves, we use these for telecommunication. So that's why it's called a radio in your car. It is receiving radio waves and it's turning that information into sound for you to hear. Microwaves, like your microwave oven at home, like we use this to heat food. It has other applications, but that's good enough for right now. 
infrared, we can use this for like thermal imaging or like night vision. Obviously, visible light is what we see, which is pretty useful. These high energy things, you can use them for like uh, to kill things, basically. So because they have high energies, uh, things don't like to live <laughs> when they get hit by this kind of radiation. So yeah, you can use UV to sterilize things. Uh, we use x-rays to do x-rays so you can see through things. So you can see through your skin to see if the bone is broken or something. And then gamma rays, we can use these for like cancer treatments and stuff, but that's obviously dangerous. So this is an active area of research. And the, this is just like a short list of things that you can do with these different wavelengths of light. So there's a lot of medical applications for all of these. And so that's another good reason for you guys to learn about some of these things. So you might not need to know enough to invent your own medical device, but it's good to kind of know how these things are working in a general sense. Okay, so this is frequency and wavelength. And so then the other thing that we talked about was the intensity of the light. And so we said that was amplitude. And another way that you can think about that is like the brightness of something. So if you were looking at something that's visible light, then a dim visible light versus a bright visible light there's obviously a difference and that difference is the intensity. And so there's three equations for the intensity that you can use interchangeably. And it really just matters what variables that you're given. So the I is the intensity. And then of course the electric field or the E is the electric field. The B is the magnetic field. And the mu naught is the permeability of free space. And the epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, which are the constants that you've seen. So if you're given just the electric field, then you can use the first equation. If you're given just the magnetic field, you can use the second equation. And if you're using the, if you're given both electric and magnetic fields, then you can use the last equation. 